What's up, Milestone? How are you? I expected a little more fired up than that. Must be like low on calories, so you're low. Let's try it again. How, Milestone, how are you? Come on, that's good. There we go. Man, what, a, what an honor to be with you tonight and to be in this season of prepare. What a great message on Sunday, right? Pastor Jeff brought. Um, I told him, I was like, now I'm gonna go home and um, get a Holy Spirit board for my 10 year old and like get out some colored markers and <laughs> teach her on the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's an honor to be here. I wanna welcome everybody online or McKinney campus. I wanna welcome everybody in the video venues. You made the right choice to be in the house of God on a Monday night. I'm just telling you, I feel like faith is in the room. I feel like there's expectation in the room for God to do something. And I just tell you, an old Pentecostal preacher I grew up listening to said, the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. That God likes to work in a place where there's expectancy in the house and I just feel like there is. We're gonna have a great time and um, man, it's an honor to be here. Thank you guys for, for having me. And uh, well, how crazy, decade later and uh, what God has done. You, you know that what you're a part of isn't normal, right? Um, in the best way, not like in the weird way. <laughs> but this isn't happening everywhere. Um, Thousands of people aren't gathering everywhere on a Monday night to seek God's face and to pray. Um, I don't know if this is exactly true. I've had an audio engineer tell me this, and so if I'm wrong, audio people don't, don't spoil my illustration. But I've heard that the worst seat in the house is the front row as far as audio is concerned, that you wanna be kind of back in the center because you feel the lows and the mids and the highs and all that because the audio kind of goes over your head on the front row. And here's what I know about when you're a church like this is every week you come in and you're on the front row of a move of God. If you're not careful, it can just go over your head and it can become common to you. And I would just encourage you, don't ever, don't ever pull in the parking lot on a weekend and go, this is common. This is God. This is special. This is a miracle you're walking in. This is a movement of God. And so, man, always honor that and, and hold that closely to you. I wanted to introduce you to my family, um, my wife, Tammy, and our four kids. I think I have a picture somewhere. There they are. Thank you. An awe, at least an awe. They're, they're the, we call them the circus, this crew. That's my wife, Tammy. Uh, my son on the right, that's Owen. He's 12, uh, seventh grade. In a month, I, I entered the teen years. He'll turn 13. My daughter, Faith, she's 10, going on 21 on the left there. And, um, and uh, we didn't know the amount of faith we would need to raise her. And so that's why there is a gap between her and her sister, who is three. <laughs> So we were not sure we wanted to make more humans if they turned out that strong-willed. Anybody against strong-willed children in the house? We weren't sure. And, um, and then a year ago, we adopted the little guy, Jonas. He is 13 months old, came to us on November the 13th, born on November the 5th. And he's a Floyd through and through. You couldn't tell he was adopted. People say he looks just like us. So, um, but it's the circus and you can pray for us. We do live in Fredericksburg, Virginia. If you all know where that is, that's Northern Virginia. So we're close to DC. So we need all the prayer we can get. Um, it, it is a circus up there as well. And uh, so any, any prayers you want to send our way as we minister to people that work in the nation's capital, we would, we would love it. But you ready for the word? I, I feel like it is. I, I believe God has something that he wants to deposit into your heart tonight. And, um, and I think we'll help build your faith. I really want to help build your faith and give you some perspective on faith. I want to bring a message entitled, Work It Out. Somebody shout, Work It Out. Now, I, my church, we're, uh, we're a very responsive kind of church, so um, we'll have a lot more fun together, and sometimes I preach shorter the more you talk to me. <laughs> so if you were hoping to get out of here, you know, the more we have fun, the quicker it's gonna go. Are y'all with me? Um, and so if something's good, you can say amen. If, uh, you know, just don't say like, oh me, or that was horrible, or please stop that, keep that to yourself, but if it's encouraging, please. Um, and so we'll, we'll have a lot of fun. But I'm going to bring called Work It Out. I have two older sisters. I'm the baby boy, which means I'm the favorite child because I'm mama's baby boy. Come on, somebody. Any, any other baby boys in the house? Yes. And so I have two older sisters. They're both two years and then four years older than me. Um, and so there's often that we would get into um, conflicts, you know, sibling robberies. I would go and we would go to mom or dad because we wanted mom or dad to resolve the issue, Right. And usually what that meant is please take my side on the issue. And so we would go to mom or dad to resolve the issue. And my parents would often look at us and they would say this thing to us. They would say, you need to go work it out. Are you with me? You need to go work it out. Now I have four kids. 
And I have two older and the two sets that the, we call the two olders the originals, and then we call the younger two the littles. And so now there's a lot of conflict because the three-year-old wants to play everything that the originals want to play. And so now there's all this fighting. And then Jonas just comes along because he's starting to walk now. And all he wants to do is like pull your hair and wreck anything that you're doing and pull things out of the cabinet. And so the kids will come and go, especially the originals, mom and dad, will you please make Abigail stop this or that? And I'll say to them now, I have the privilege as a parent to now look at them and go, you guys need to learn to, you need to learn to work it out, right? And the reason that I say that to them is most of the time not because I don't want a parent in the moment. Let's be real honest, there's just some moments. <laughs> Can I be really honest that there's some moments where I wanna turn the door handle of their room the other way where I control the lock on the outside. <laughs> Come on somebody, right? And so there, it's not often that I, I don't wanna deal with the issue, it's that this, it's that I understand that by forcing them into a situation where they have to resolve the conflict, I am helping them build a skill set that they're gonna need later on in their life because there's gonna be a moment when they graduate and, and hopefully within a few days they're gonna move out. And <laughs> I'm just joking. Not if their mom has anything to do with it. I tell the baby girls they can stay, the boys, they gotta go. But I'm helping develop something on the inside of them, a skill set on them that they're gonna need later in life. They're gonna know, need to know how to resolve conflict. They're gonna need to know how to work well with other people. They're gonna one day go into an employment situation where they've gotta know how to have interpersonal skills. Are y'all following me? And so by sending them back into the situation to work it out, I'm not doing something to them. I'm actually developing something in them. And I would propose to you that you and I will face some, some challenging situations in life. If, if you don't know this, Jesus said that in this world you will have trouble. And you may be thinking, well, can you be more positive on this night? I'm positive you'll have trouble. <laughs> in this world, you will have trouble. Now, he goes on to say, but take heart because I've overcome the world. But it doesn't negate the first part of that verse that says you will have trouble in this life or you'll have challenging moments or you're going to have struggles in this life. And some of you know this. You look back at 2019 and you think, wow, that is a year I'm ready to get rid of and not relive again because of the challenges I faced. And, or maybe you've come into this year and you're already facing challenges. And, and I don't want to discourage you, but there may be some on the horizon that you don't even know about. And some of us have a view of God. We think that God is supposed to make everything smooth and easy in our life. And that God, if you really love me, then these challenges I'm facing, you're just gonna take away from me. And I would say and propose to you and maybe help flip your perspective tonight of this is that God may not remove them, but he may leverage them. And he may leverage them in your life for the purpose of developing something in you that cannot be developed any other way than you to walk through something that may be difficult. And that thing that he's wanting to develop is something called faith. Something called faith. Now, what is faith? Well, the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith isn't the feeling you get when they start singing God of the Breakthrough. Although that's, an, what a song, wow, incredible team. But that's not, the, that's not the goosebumps that you get when that song comes on. Faith isn't the emotion that you get. The Bible says that faith is evidence. Now evidence is something that you present in a courtroom. Evidence is something that is tangible, that's observable, that I can see, that I can watch, that I can, I can look with my eyes. Evidence is the thing that whenever the judge says, do you have proof for the case that you were trying to prove, evidence is what you present. And so faith is my evidence that I believe what God says is true. So if I were standing in the courtroom of heaven, my faith would be the evidence that I believe God. And the Bible also tells us that not only is faith evidence, but faith is substance. And it tells us this about faith, that without it, we can't please God. So it seems to me that one of the primary things God is gonna wanna do in your life while you are on the earth is develop faith that one of the primary things he's gonna to wanna to do in your life on the earth is develop your faith. If it is the one thing that without it you can't please God, then obviously he's gonna develop it in you so that you can live a life that is pleasing to him. If you're with me, say amen. amen. And I have found that faith doesn't develop in the comforts of the familiar, but faith is developed in the uncomfortable. 
Faith is developed in the challenging. Faith is developed in the hard moments, in the challenging moments. Because it is not that God is doing something to you in those moments. He is trying to build something in you in those moments because he's going to know what you need down the road. Just like I know that there'll come a day where my kids need some skill sets that if I don't help them develop now, they won't be prepared down the road. God sees from eternity to beginning till end, and he sees your life from when you were born to when you die, and he understands that in the next season of your life, if you don't develop some strength in your faith in this season, you may not be prepared to go to that season. I think it's why some believers live stuck in their life because God will not allow them to go into a season that will crush them because they refuse to develop the faith in this season. And so we're going, God, why are you doing this to me? And God is going, no, I'm not doing anything to you. I'm trying to develop something in you. And I want us to look at the story of a character in the Old Testament by the name of Hannah. And I think we draw out some truths about how God was developing faith in her to do something significant through her. So if you have a Bible, 1 Samuel chapter one is where we're gonna be reading. I'm gonna, we're gonna read a little bit and then talk about it a little bit and read a little bit and preach on it a little bit. Is that all right with y'all? Great, both of you, that's awesome. <laughs> is that all right with y'all? Yeah. Hey, there we go. 1 Samuel chapter one, verse three. The Bible says this, year after year, this man, this man being Elkanah, went up from his town to worship and sacrificed to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh where Hophni and Phinehas, not Phinehas and Ferb if you're parents. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. I don't know that I've ever been so distraught I could not eat. Come on, somebody. <laughs> So picture this with me for a moment, what Hannah is experiencing. She is married um, to Elkanah. He has another wife. Pastor Jeff's gonna address that whole thing on Sunday. <laughs> and in this culture, having a child was a big deal. And she's unable to bear a child while the other wife is able to bear children and not only is she without and maybe disappointed, maybe disappointed in herself, maybe disappointed in her situation, maybe even disappointed with God, but she has an antagonist that constantly is irritating her. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the, the, the place in your life where you are desperately wanting something that you cannot have on your own? And not only are you feeling the emotion of that and the desperation of that and the pain of that, but at the same time, you have an antagonist that is continually reminding you of where you are not enough. Constantly reminding you of where you lack and where you don't measure up and where you can't produce the thing that you really want to produce. And so Hannah finds herself in that place and she goes up to worship and she is so distraught that she's unable to eat, that she's weeping. And I wonder if you've ever been in a place in your life where there was such a desire for something or there was something missing in your life that it brought you to the place of weeping. I would imagine all of us have been in a place where we have wept those kind of tears. I call them the silent tears. It's the one that maybe nobody sees and you tell nobody about, but they're tears nonetheless. And this is where she's at. And she finds herself in a deficit. The deficit is the place between where she is currently, her current situation, and what she really wants in life. And I would propose this, if you're a note taker, write this down, number one, is that the deficits in our life are faith's opportunity. That we often see the deficits in our life as the obstacle. That, that God, why are you not doing this? Oh, it's the obstacle. If God would just fix this or solve this issue, then everything would be great in my life. And so we see it as an obstacle. And I would say that, no, it is the opportunity. That faith doesn't grow in comfort, that faith doesn't grow when everything is wonderful, that faith actually grows when there are deficits in your life. So without deficits, there is no opportunity for faith to grow. 
Hannah was in a deficit. She was in a place where she could not have a child, but there was a gap between there and what she really wanted was to be able to have a child. And all of us, if we're honest, we have some gaps in our life. We have some deficits in our life. Maybe in this season of prepare, you are believing God for something. There is a deficit in your life. Where you are is not the marriage that you want, but you're believing for it, and there is a deficit right now. And where you are with your child is not where you want to be, and they're far from God, and there's a deficit in your life. And where you are financially, there is a deficit, or in your career, or whatever it may be, we all can identify some deficit in our life. And often we're asking God to remove the deficit when God is saying, no, I want to leverage the deficit because it could be the deficit that actually grows your faith strengthens your faith and takes your faith to another level I remember whenever my daughter faith was we were in that process of you know Tammy was pregnant and and we were excited and it was baby number two and you know baby number two is a little bit different um, over Christmas we were decluttering the house and because um, it's my spiritual gift throwing things away and uh, so I just, I had, you know, just this Holy Spirit moment as I took dump runs in my Suburban with the seats down completely full, two of them. I was just like, this is God here. <laughs> and, but Tammy and I were laughing how we have all these photo albums, like we had this tub for Owen, like the first child. Photo albums, first birthday, and then Faith has like a little box, <laughs> and then Abigail and Jonas, nothing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just first child is one thing. Second, by the second, I love first time parents. We have a lot of young people on our staff and they're like first time parents and they're, they're sanitizing pacifiers. You know, we call them the plug and, and they're just, everything's not. And by the second one, you're like, you know, Jonas now, I'm just like, and put it back, right, stick the pacifier back. In. But, and so we were around number two and it was still a little bit new, you know? And so we went to the doctor one day and we were doing the ultrasounds and all that, and we, found, we always found out at week 20, we wanted to find out as soon as we could. You know, my wife started to buy stuff. And so we wanted to find out as soon as we can, found out as a little girl. And, um, and so then we get a call though after the ultrasound, they're like, hey, we need, to, we need you to come back, we wanna do a more detailed ultrasound. We were like, okay, um, that, this doesn't sound great, but we'll come back for that, that's fine. Um, and so we come back and it's like detailed ultrasound and some of it was like 3D imaging that was before that was a, a massive, a big thing to do. And, and so we went into the ultrasound and then we're like, oh, look at her and you know, her face and all that, it's all cute. Um, and, and so then they pull us into a room and they go, uh, we, we wanna know if you wanna do some further testing because we have found some um, abnormalities on the brain. And it was to see if she would have some kind of mental disability. And we were like, no, we don't need to do that testing um, because we're not giving her up. We'll, we'll raise her and keep her, so we don't, we, don't need to, we don't need to put her through that, the trauma, or my wife through the trauma. And I, di I didn't say it in the room, but I just thought, um, and I, my God's bigger than that. I had that thought, but if I could be real honest, and maybe you've been in this place, uh, I wish I could say it was like that day, I was like, by his stripes we are healed, he's the God that healeth thee, he's the great physician. I don't think it was the first day, I don't think it was the second day, it may have been a week later because my mind was swimming with thoughts like, uh, will she say daddy? Will I ever walk her down the aisle? I'm not looking forward to that, but I kind of was looking forward to that, but I'm kind of not. Does that make sense, Dad? I was thinking I'll never get to clean my guns in front of somebody that's coming to, you know, just all these thoughts. And I don't, I don't know where once I got through the emotion of, of what could happen that was horrible in her life and, and not what we really wanted to sign up for. I, I don't know how long, if it was a week or two weeks, but I do know that I faced a deficit in my life. I faced a great deficit of where I was and what medicine was telling me was gonna be the outcome for, for my 10-year-old little girl. And I remember night after night, my wife would fall asleep and I would lay my hand on her stomach and I would just say, you will live and you will not die. That God is a God that heals 
that God is the God of the miracle. And I would just begin to beg God, God, will you heal my little girl? Will you touch her brain? What, what medicine can't do, will you do in the supernatural? But nothing in my natural strength can do. I can't buy it with my money. I can't ingenue it, strategize it. I can't create it, God. What I can't do in my natural, can you do in the supernatural, God? Will you touch her body? Will you heal her? Will you make her speech? Will you cause every DNA and every cell and every part of her body to line up with the way? Psalms 139 says, God, that you knit her together in her mother's womb. And so, God, would you cause everything to line up the way? And I'm just telling you, in the middle of my deficit, I grew some faith muscles that I'd never had before in my life. I had to believe God like I'd never believed him before. I had to grow like I'd never grown before. But if I didn't have the deficit, I wouldn't have the strength now. And so the deficit wasn't an obstacle in my life. It was an opportunity in my life for God to do something significant in me, not to me. And I'm just trying to tell you that some of you are facing deficits and going, God, why are you doing this to me? It's because he's got a great purpose and plan for you, and he's trying to work a muscle in you that otherwise would not be worked. See, I think sometimes we're praying counterproductive prayers. God, use me. God, make me a blessing. God, take away this struggle. God, remove this difficulty. And I think God is going, wait, I thought you wanted to be used. Wait, wait, I thought you wanted to be made into a blessing. I thought you wanted to be blessed to bless other people. I thought you wanted me to make your life have an impact and make a difference. And, and I've got to get the infrastructure and the strength around you so that when I put the weight of the blessing on you that I want to put, you can uphold it and handle it. If I were to put the thing on you now, you would crush and fall underneath it. So I've got to build some muscle in you. So I've got to create some deficits in your life and leverage them for the glory of God and for the strength and of your faith. If you're with me, shout amen. amen. Hannah was in a deficit, but the deficit wasn't an obstacle. It was face opportunity. And I'm just telling you that every deficit in your life is an opportunity for God to build faith on the inside of you like you've never had before. So she's weeping, right? She's weeping, and we, we skip down a few verses, and it says this in verse 12. It says, as she kept praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. And Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk, and he said to her, how long will you keep getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. And she said, not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. She's like, I'm not red solo cup or glass. <laughs> I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went away, ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. H Hannah is weeping to such a point that she can't even engage her vocal cords. I don't know if you've ever faced something in life so painful that you can't even get, get your mouth to utter the depths of the pain inside your heart. And she, she is crying, her mouth is moving, but no words are coming out of her mouth and she's weeping before the Lord. And the, the man of God goes, you're obviously drunk. And she goes, no, I'm not, I'm so distraught. And then he says this to her. He basically says, may God give you what you're asking for. And then immediately, her face was no longer downcast and she went and ate something. She's weeping to the point she can't even engage her vocal cords. She is physiologically overwhelmed with grief, anxiety, like physiologically there's something going on with her. He says, may the Lord grant you what you have asked. She gets up, no longer downcast, and wants to eat. The only difference from this moment 
And this moment is a word from God. So if the deficit is face foundation, or is face opportunity, the word is our faith's foundation. The only difference between what she got here and what happened here is she got a word from the man of God. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. And immediately her face was no longer downcast and she was ready to eat. Now here's what I mean by a word from the Lord. And, and this is what I, I love about this church is you have a pastor that preaches the word. You don't need a self-help talk. You don't need a nice little five steps to this. You need thus says the Lord. It is the word of God, it is a word from God that can change everything about your life and it did for her. Now when we talk about a word from God, there's two different things. There's, there's, um, there's logos, there's the word, there's, there's the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And then the Bible also talks about a rhema word. It is a word from within the word. That means that from within the word, there, there comes out a word. So in this message, I could be preaching and every, there could, there could be a thousand different rhema words that God gives you in the moment. It's, it's what the Holy Spirit does. It, it brings something to your attention. It draws something to you in the moment that is revelation for you that you need in this season. It is an on time, in the season word from the word. Are y'all with me? And so Hannah got one of those rhema moment words where God spoke to her and said, and that word changed everything about her. It changed her countenance. She was ready to eat. She was ready to move on. She went from distraught to everything is great because she got a word from God. And can I tell you, the reason she was able to get a word from God is because she had positioned herself in the right place to get a word from God. This is why it's so important for faithfulness to the house of God. And I know I may be preaching to the choir, but if I could just remind you, you come in here every week and God, you position yourself when you attend church to get a rhema word from God that may need the word that you need on Monday. Because you don't know what Wednesday's gonna bring, but God knows, and he may be setting up things, ordering them to give you the word that you need so you can root your faith into something, not just what you feel and not just what seems right, right and not what is the wisdom of this world but a wisdom that comes from God so you can root your life and your foundation into it now notice when she got the word from God she immediately got up this tells me that she didn't just hear the word but she had faith in the word because she acted on it I think for many believers today we are well educated beyond the level of our obedience and we like to call it faith, but it isn't faith, it's just head knowledge. Faith is evidence. And my evidence is this, Hannah had the evidence whenever she got the word from God that God would grant what she had requested, she got up and went and ate. She stopped crying. She stopped being distraught, why? Because she got a word from God. It's like the guy at, in Acts whenever Peter came to him into the city gate called Beautiful and he was lame and he laid there all the time and that's what they did. They dragged him out there and he said to him, he said, silver and gold I do not have. You remember the story? He said, but what I do have you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, right? The man got a word. Now watch this. He would have died by that city gate if he had never put his two feet underneath him. He had a word, but he had to act on the word, and that is faith. It's not just enough to know it. You have to act on it. You have to live it out. He could have stayed there lame. He could have been like, well, I can't really get up. I've never walked. And Peter said, I'm sorry, silver and gold I don't have. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. If that man had never got up, I don't know what he did. I don't know if he went down on his knees first and was wobbly and put one foot under it and another foot under it. He may have felt like this is crazy. I could fall on my face, but he acted on the word because he got a word. And when he got the word, then the miracle came after he acted on the word because the word is faith's foundation. That's why it's so important that you know what is the word of God for you. So it's so important that you're in atmospheres like this so as you pray, you can anchor your faith to something, to what God has to say. See, many of us, we think the word of God is like nice stories and, um, or, or, or we'll feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, something to us, and we already dismiss it in our head as God can't do that. 
You hear stories like you were told Sunday about, about miracles happening, about legitimate physical healing happening. And in your mind, you disqualify yourself. Well, God would never do that in my life, even though that is the word of God that he can do that. And what we do in that is we tell God how big he can be in our life. God, this is how big you can be in my life. I'm gonna limit you to, to this or to this box or to this. I'm just telling you that maybe in this season you would allow your mind to expand and your heart to open up to go, God, I'm gonna let you be God in my life. And if your word says it, then I'm gonna believe it. I don't necessarily understand how it all fleshes out and the nuances of how it all works out, but I've just determined if you wanna be a way maker, then God be a way maker in my life. If you wanna be the God that opens doors that no man can close, then open doors in my life, God. If you wanna be a healer, then God be a healer. If you wanna be a restorer of marriages, then God be a restorer of marriages. If you wanna be a God that can give me the breakthrough that I need, then you be it. Let's not limit God, let's just open the box and say, God, be God and do what you want to do. I'm going to believe your word. I'm not going to limit him. I'm not going to put God in some confined thing that can fit within my mind. Listen to me. If I wanted to serve a God that could fit within my limited understanding, it would be a God I created. I need a God that cannot fit within my limited understanding because I need a God that is outside of me that is bigger than me, that when he speaks, even though I may not be able to see it, I can trust because he said it. You can't live your life on what you see. You gotta live your life based on what has thus said the Lord. Because sometimes it won't look like what you want it to look like. But if he said it in the right time, he will come through on it. You know, I, I like this thought. God, when he speaks, isn't telling you what he hopes will happen. He's telling you what will happen. Our job is just to trust him and to anchor our life into his word. Anchor our soul into his word. Can I tell you something? When I prayed over my little girl, all I had was what the word told me. Because the report from the doctor said one thing. And my mind was telling me another thing, but I had to anchor my soul in the word of what God had said. Because the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Remains forever. So if the deficit really is an opportunity and the word is our foundation, then I wanna draw out one more thing that we see about Hannah. In verse um, number 26, it says this. Now, she's had the child, and it's been uh, several years now, and she's weaning the boy off of nursing, and, and Eli comes to her and says, do you wanna go worship? And um, he tells, she says no, and, um, and then the next year, she's like, do you wanna come worship? And she's like, yeah, this is the year. And says this, and she said to him, to Eli, she said, as surely as you live, my Lord, I'm the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. And I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being so desperate for something you finally get it, and then you return it back to God. See, the testing of her faith was not could she believe for Samuel. The testing of her faith was because she'd give Samuel back to God once he gave him to her. The true test of our faith is are we willing to sacrifice the thing God gives us? Can you imagine two years Jonas, my little one, is 13 months, not two years yet, but the bonding that has already happened, the relationship that's already taken place, the love, the memories that have already been created, the first steps, the first words. He's into saying this right now, this, this. And then I'm gonna leave him at the temple. 
Can you imagine? The true test of her faith was not, could she believe the prayer? The true test of her faith is once God put the blessing in her hand, could she still live open-handedly? See, I have found this, that it's often the blessing of God that becomes the very thing that keeps us from receiving the next thing God wants to do in our life. Because when you had nothing and you begin to pray, there's those little, I, I, I was thinking back when your message Sunday, I remember those prayers when we had 50 people in the church and I was like, God, uh, can we make payroll this week in the name of Jesus, please help us. Can we pay the rent this week? And they were, they were, and when you got those, it was like, oh God, you're moving, this is amazing. And now that there's lots of people on staff and, and, and benefits and all these things I'm responsible for, it's like, oh, I wanna kinda get my hand around it and grip it and, and it's, but can I still live as open-handed as I did when it was just 50 people coming to the church? Because the very thing that is in my hand, God put there and I begged him for it. The blessing of my home, the very thing God put in my hand, all the provision in my, everything in my life, God put in my hand. I came into this world and I'll leave with nothing. And God put everything that is in my hand. And what happens to us is we start to get our grip on it. And God goes, no, 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 I need you to still live open-handed because the next thing I wanna put in your hand is greater, but if you can't live open-handed, then I can't fit more into you. And so the testing of your faith isn't, can you believe God for some great prayer? The testing of your faith is once God gives it to you, can you still live surrendered? Can you still live open-handed? Because God isn't doing something to you, God is wanting to do something through you. Do you remember that? God's not wanting to do something to you, God is wanting to do something through you. Are you with me? And God wasn't doing something to Hannah, he was doing something through Hannah because it was Samuel that would end up anointing David the king and it is through David that Jesus was come. So Samuel wasn't about Samuel and Hannah, it was about a nation, it was about a Messiah that would come. And listen to me, it wasn't even about Samuel because Hannah would go on to have five more children. So God wasn't giving her a son, God was opening her womb to give her many sons. And what I'm trying to get you to see that is in the deficits of your life, God isn't doing something to you, he is doing something through you and is not just about the thing that you are believing for right now. Don't think so limited, don't think so short game, don't think so small, it's not about that little thing that you're praying for right now. I know it seems big and it seems insurmountable, but God is going to open the womb so that he can birth many things and many things and miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle miracle in your life and so he's got to work your faith out somebody shout work it out you got to work it out so in the deficit don't give up we need you Hannah the world needs your Samuel the world needs your gift the church needs your gift don't give up on that marriage your kids need it don't give up on that child. Keep praying, keep believing. God will use them to change the world. Don't give up on the dream that God has put in your heart. Even though you can't see it, trust what he said. Let his word be your foundation because what he is birthing through you isn't just about today. It's about generation after generation after generation. If you receive the word, give Jesus your greatest praise.